Good morning. Or for those of you like me who came in from China and are still on Beijing time, Wan Chang Hao. Thank you, Vivian, and the Asia Society, and the College Board, and the Chicago Public Schools for inviting me here today. I have to tell you that this is an especially interesting occasion uh, to talk to you, because our event, a discussion of the China story, happens to combine several of the things that are most central to my life, China, Chicago, and storytelling. But to understand what I mean, you have to know that my first job in the world was right here in Chicago as a cub reporter for the Chicago Tribune. It was 13 years ago, and I was on the metro desk of the newspaper writing stories about things that happened in the city. I was midway through college, and I arrived here as a summer intern, but the truth was that my mind was elsewhere, because like a lot of people in this room, I had recently been bitten by the China bug. I was preparing to go to China for the first time. I was in the process of making my final arrangements to go to Beijing to show Du Shifan Dashue for a semester of studying Chinese. But every day, I sat in this chaotic Tribune newsroom, and every time I had a free moment, I would pull out my Chinese flashcards and start studying my Chinese characters. So anybody who would ask me, I would explain, well, and I had the passion of the converted at the time, I should tell you, that I was getting ready to move to Beijing to live in a Chinese dormitory, to set aside everything that I knew and loved, and to try to get as deeply immersed in Chinese as I could, studying it for five or six hours a day. And every time I said that, the response was the same. What are you, nuts? <laughs> well, what a difference 13 years can make. Today, nobody would bother to question why a young person would want to go to China and to study the language and to study a place that is so obviously and unmistakably central to the future of America and the planet. But in the same span of time, just over a decade, the subject of China itself has been transformed economically, socially, environmentally, and in more subtle ways, politically. After 5,000 years of history, it can feel like we're adding a new chapter every month. Indeed, one of my favorite expressions these days in China among friends of mine in Beijing is that the length of each generation is shrinking. It used to be that the great swings of Chinese history happened in 30-year cycles. We had, of course, the May 4th movement followed by the Communist Revolution, followed by the reform and opening up period, and finally by the Olympics and China's emergence in the world. But today, it feels like every swing happens in five to 10-year cycles at the most. So the burden to interpret and explain these changes falls, I'm sorry to say, on all of us. The educators, scholars, policymakers, and writers, anyone with an interest and an obligation to help bridge the gaps that separate us. Language is indispensable, of course, and that's why we're here, but beyond the language itself, how do we present China to the world in all of its glorious complexity and contradictions? Every day we face the very real challenge of going beyond the easy symbols and legends associated with China in search of its, its newest cutting edge. China's history has great appeal to observers, but it can also be a distraction from what's happening in the here and now. To linger on the Great Wall and the drama of the Communist Revolution without bringing our sense of China up to date is about as complete as trying to understand America with a trip to Mount Rushmore and a discussion of the Boston Tea Party. So, for instance, how do we help our students and our neighbors reconcile the images of a country in which you have spectacular world-class stadiums and high-rises being built in less time than it takes to put up a single condominium in the United States, and yet the air in Beijing remains so thick and polluted that on some days those stadiums and high-rises disappear entirely into the haze? How do we help them understand that China has lifted more people out of poverty in less time than any nation in world history, while at the same time, under the banner of the Communist Party, the gap between rich and poor has grown so large that a child born today in Qinghai province is seven times more likely to die by the age of five as a child born in Beijing. How do we set aside our own stereotypes, and indeed our own aspirations for China, in order to explain it in the most accurate and up-to-date terms? One valuable framework that I've adopted for understanding and explaining China to others is the notion that the nation is in the midst of an era defined above all by pluralism. 
by a dramatic explosion of the boundaries of Chinese identity. The definition of what it means to be Chinese, politically, economically, socially, is being stretched and squeezed at the dawn of the 21st century. It's easy to forget that we're just 30 years, after all, one generation since the most intense spasm of conformity and ideological discipline in modern world history, the Cultural Revolution, and yet China today is being redefined in ways that confound and enlighten us. To explain what I mean, I'm going to tell you briefly today about three individuals, a few interesting people who I've come to know, who I think are at the forefront of some important developments in the China story. These are the kinds of people who might help foreigners, particularly young foreigners, gain a richer and more nuanced understanding of the place they're studying, both its contradictions and its sensibilities. So let's go back for a moment to a rather tense moment in China last spring. You might recall that last March, there was an eruption of social unrest, thanks. An eruption of social unrest in Lhasa, the Tibetan capital. The Chinese authorities brought it under control, and in doing so, they also encountered criticism from abroad for the tactics. China was just months away at that point from hosting the Olympics, and in many ways, these events became conflated in the public consciousness. When the Olympic torch went on its relay around the world, it became, in many ways, a referendum on the Chinese leadership. It was harassed everywhere it went, in Paris, San Francisco, and so on. Everybody here remembers this. In the middle of it, in China, thousands of people rose up to defend the Olympics and to defend what they saw as China's dignity, China's honor. They rose up and demonstrated in front of Carrefour, the French supermarket chain, because as they say, France had exhibited pro-Tibetan sympathies. In the middle of that, a video popped up on the Chinese internet. It was called China Stand Up, and it was posted on Sina, and it became a sensation. It was a homemade documentary, about six minutes long, in a mix of Chinese and English. These are some screenshots from the video. And it combined news photos, text, video, and a stirring orchestral soundtrack to create the sense of a nation under siege. It blamed Western investors for manipulating the Chinese stock market. It blamed the global financial system for inflation and everything from pork prices to real estate. The image it created was of, as the film put it, a new Cold War. It became one of the hottest items on the Chinese internet. At one point, it was being clicked on twice every second. It had become a manifesto for what is known in Chinese as the Fenqing, or the angry youth. This burst of nationalism was the most visible and in many ways dynamic political or ideological expression that I'd seen in China in the four years that I'd been living there. And I was desperate to figure out what they were really trying to say. Were they really angry at the West, or was there something more subtle, more complex going on here? To answer that question, I figured I needed to find out who made this video. It didn't have a signature. So as always, the first thing I did was to call a Chinese friend who works in the Chinese media. They always know more than we do. I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but I figured I would probably find a bully or a nut, somebody holed up in his parents' basement. But I can tell you that it was not the man who it turned out to be. This is Tang Jie. He's a baby-faced 27-year-old getting his PhD at Versity. He studies Western philosophy, Western political philosophy. And more specifically, he studies phenomenology. And even more specifically, he studies a branch that is so sophisticated and obscure that I won't pretend to, to say that I understand it. The first day we met, he was dressed basically like he could be a student at the University of Chicago. He would have looked right at home here. He was unbelievably polite and welcoming to me. First thing he did was try to pay for my cab fare. <laughs> but to tell you a little bit more about Tang Jie, he's the son of a farming family. His parents don't read or write. He's the first member of his family to go to college. These days, he spends most of his time working on his dissertation, but he's also engaged to be married to a lovely graduate student named Wan Man Lu. In his room, he has more or less the entire spectrum of human thought. He has Lao Tzu, books by Thomas Friedman, uh, Who Moved My Cheese. Uh, <laughs> he speaks English, German, he reads ancient Greek and Latin. In other words, he's unbelievably normal. I started spending... 
I started spending a fair bit of time with Tang Jie and his friends, a group of about five or six men and women who share his thinking, and I came to recognize a very specific combination of confidence and optimism, frustration and curiosity that was typical of many of China's most educated and dynamic young people. Compared to the Chinese students who demonstrated in Tiananmen Square 20 years ago, in the name of multi-party elections and the freedom of expression, this generation of students, the men and women of Tang Jie's age and stage, are asking for something more nuanced. As Tang Jie put it to me, we accept the values of human rights. We accept the values of democracy. The question is how to realize them for us. In short, Tang Jie and his colleagues believe in reform, but not radical change. He wants greater access to U.S. markets for Chinese companies. He wants an end to congressional activism against Chinese companies' attempts to buy American firms. He wants the Western media to talk about China without talking about human rights all the time. And long before the world was in a recession, Tong and his friends were calling on the Chinese government to diversify their holdings of U.S. dollar-backed securities. So they were onto something. Most of all, he wants the world to recognize that China is today not the country that it was 10 or 15 years ago, and to recognize the progress it's made in raising the standard of living for its citizens, and that it's the kind of place where the child of illiterate farmers can get a PhD in Western philosophy and use the web to give his own personal message to the world. In fact, the most important thing about Tang Jie is that even though his video makes us uncomfortable in the West, you can be sure that the leadership in Beijing is even more uncomfortable. They know that the emotions that elevated this video to a phenomenon on the Chinese internet do not simply mean a love of party, a love of leaders. These people are proud of what they and their leaders have created, but they place their pride foremost in the Chinese people, in the glory of the Chinese nation, not necessarily in the party. These young people's targets are injustice and humiliation. And if they perceive that injustice and humiliation is coming from abroad in the form of criticism that they consider unfair, then they will speak out. But if they perceive it as coming from within, they speak out as well, and they've become frequent critics of official corruption. Not everyone is like Tang Jie, of course. There's also young liberal Democrats on Chinese universities, and they're worth following. But when the video ignited last spring, it was not a Democrat who was behind it. The point is that we can be sure that these days, Chinese activism is not dead, and the impulse for free expression remains. It's very much alive, but the message has changed, and these are neither idealists nor cynics. They're not skinheads, and they're not freedom fighters. And the responsibility is on us to listen closely to what they're saying and to try to explain their message to the world. The next person I'm going to tell you about today is, in fact, not Chinese at all. His name is Joseph Nwusu, and he's a 29-year-old Nigerian merchant who lives and works in Guangzhou. Joseph's been in China for about three years, and life for him is pretty difficult. He spends about $30 a month on rent. He has a tiny apartment in a fishing village outside of Guangzhou, sleeps on a mattress on the floor. Every day he travels about an hour and a half to get to where he works, which is the Canaan Export Clothes Trading Center, a sort of dingy marketplace in the center of Guangzhou, which sells everything, clothes, industrial parts, bulletproof, bulletproof vests, uh, an evening of companionship, as it was offered to me more than once in the neighborhood. But the thing that distinguishes the Canaan market is that almost all of its customers are from West Africa, Nigeria, Mali, Ghana, and other places. And they've come to China, like Joseph, in order to buy goods and ship them back home. In fact, traders like Joseph are arriving in such large numbers that last November, China instituted its first nonstop flight between Africa and China. And it doesn't go to Beijing or Shanghai, it goes to Guangzhou. The neighborhood has grown so fast and has become so closely associated with them that taxi drivers call it Chocolate City. <laughs> Joseph and his friends prefer to call it Canaan, after the Promised Land. Now, I should say that Joseph did not intend to end up in Canaan. In fact, he wanted to come to the United States, or to Germany, or to Holland, and he applied for visas in all these places, but he got turned down. China, of course, is interested in developing its relationships in Africa, and so it was easier for him to get a visa to come to China. So he boarded the first airplane of his life, and got off in Beijing with nothing but the scribbled phone number of a stranger, somebody from the same village who'd come about four months earlier. He had called him up, he asked for help, and the guy gave him a few leads to get him started. But things were not easy. In the beginning, Joseph's first deal 
fell through. He bought $2,000 worth of computer parts, shipped them to Nigeria. When they arrived, he figured out he'd bought useless junk. He couldn't even give it away. It had wiped out his savings, and as he put it to me, there were days where he went, out, he went without eating entirely. But over time, things have improved, and Joseph has stayed. In fact, things are good enough that he stayed long after his visa expired, and he's become what's known in Chinese as a triple illegal person. It's illegal for him to be there, it's illegal for him to have entered, and it's illegal certainly for him to run a business. But China is full of triple illegal persons at the moment. The best estimate is, is that there are 20,000 Africans in Guangzhou, most of them living illegally. It's a very large and quite permanent community. Some of them have brought their families. Some of them have put their children into Chinese schools, and indeed there are some who are now in college. In many cases, families are, uh, you have mixed-race families with African visitors settling down with Chinese wives, and if you go to a church on Sunday in Guangzhou, you're guaranteed to see children running around outside in the plaza speaking a combination of English, Chinese, French, and Igbo from Nigeria. What's amazing about this is that the African community in Guangzhou, of course, didn't exist a decade ago. And for China, this is something quite new. For most of its history, China was so poor that it could scarcely imagine that anyone except a missionary or a marauder would want to come and stay. But this is different. And today, China is confronting the fact that it's increasingly a destination for people, not just a source. Many sociologists now predict that within a generation, China will have several, prominent, several permanent African communities. So what does this mean for China? It means that today's Chinese conception of its own identity, its perceptions of race as well, are beginning to change. The truth is that racism has a long history in China, just as it does in America. The traditional Chinese thought that fair skin indicates intelligence and beauty, while dark skin is associated with peasants who toil in the sun, is beginning gradually to change. In Guangzhou, new arrivals still face resistance. There are landlords who refuse to rent to them. There are covenants, just as there were in the United States. But gradually, surveys show that acts of discrimination are declining. Africans and African Americans who live in China feel more at home every day. There's a green card program underway. It's small, but there's indications, certainly in Shanghai and other places, that they want it to grow. Fundamentally, it seems China's dawning to the notion that someday there will be Chinese people who don't look Chinese. Traditionally, the Chinese have not defined themselves by formal notions of citizenship. It's not about what passport you hold or what bureaucracy you went through. In fact, it's about skin color and history. But being in Guangzhou these days, watching African Chinese children and their parents who've come in search of a better life, I can't help but imagine how it must have felt to be in New York at the turn of the 20th century when my grandparents came from Poland, for instance. And here in Chicago, of course, looking at the thousands of young African American and Latino students who are learning Chinese, I'm delighted to know that more and more of them will feel at home in China someday. But before I move on from Joseph's story, I should add that perhaps the clearest sign of how immigration is affecting China can be found in the story of another African who lives in China named Mark Indesenjo. He lives in Shenzhen. He's married to a Chinese woman, has a small business there, volunteers at a local orphanage. He also happens to be the brother of Barack Obama. Half-brother. They share the same father, Barack Obama Sr. And in fact, they look so much alike that when Barack Obama met Mark Indesenjo about 10 years ago, as he's written about in his book, he said it felt like looking in a foggy mirror. <laughs> so you've got two Obama sons, one in Washington and one in Shenzhen. Now, I think we're rather a long way from seeing an Obama offspring take up residence at Zhongnanhai. <laughs> but the sheer fact of where the Obama sons have ended up in the world today is a notable measure of China's evolving identity. There's one last person that I'd like to tell you about today who represents some of the most cutting edge ideas in China as far as I'm concerned, ideas about style. He's a movie director named Jia Zhang Ke. And you can be forgiven if you haven't seen his films, which include Platform, Zhan Tai, Still Life, San Xia Hao Ren, and The World, Shi Jie. But before long, I suspect you'll be hearing about Jia Zhang Ke. His movies are starting to be released in the West, and it's hard to overstate how much of a sensation he has caused among film critics and serious moviegoers. He has a long list of film festival prizes from Venice and everywhere else, Chicago, certainly New York. But to give you the clearest sense of the impact he's had, when I interviewed Martin Scorsese about him, Scorsese told me, well, Jia Zhang Ke is redefining cinema. 
not just for China, but around the world. So what's he doing? Well, to understand what Jia is saying about China today, you have to know where Jia comes from. Jia Zhangke grew up in the city of Fenyang, in the coal country of Shanxi province. His mother worked in a government shop, and his father was a school teacher who'd never been allowed to go to college because his family was classified as landlords. From a young age, Jia was obsessed with escaping town. He, when he was old enough to ride a bike, he cycled 10 miles just to glimpse the sight of a passing train. He would not see the ocean until he was 26 years old. But while he was a teenager in the 1980s, foreign pop culture began inundating Fenyang, and it began to change Jia Zhangke's life. All of a sudden, he and his friends were no longer singing, we workers have power, or we are the heirs of communism. He was singing, the moonlight represents my heart. It was all about my heart. It was about me, the individual, as he told me. And it had a deep effect on him. In fact, but the pop culture, I should say, that got to Fenyang was kind of erratic. He never saw Citizen Kane, or Star Wars for that matter, but he did see Breakin, an unbelievably campy breakdancing movie that's based on West Side Story. And he saw it, as he told me, seven or eight times. And he memorized all the moves. To this day, Jia Zhangke speaks Mandarin and he speaks Fenyang dialect, but he doesn't speak English. If you want to speak to Jia Zhangke, you need to speak Chinese. Jia decided that he wanted to make movies, and when he was old enough to leave Fenyang, he applied to the Beijing Film Academy, and he was rejected twice. It didn't help that he knew virtually nothing about film. In the whole city of Fenyang, he'd been able to find two books on film, and one of them was half of a two-volume set, so he had no idea what he was talking about. He got into the Film Academy on his third attempt, and at the time, Chinese movies were actually well-known around the world, but they were different. They were films like Raise the Red Lantern, Red Sorghum, Farewell My Concubine, Hero, films that are epic. These are dramatic, allegorical dramas set in China's ancient history or often around martial arts. But Jia wanted to make a very different kind of movie. As he saw it, those kinds of epic blockbusters had nothing to do with real life or the world that he knew in China, the world that he'd grown up with. As he put it, a world as coarse and ignorant but full of vitality as a roadside weed. He wanted to make movies about the reality of his China, and he wanted to use regional dialect instead of using Putonghua, which was a radical idea at the time. It was still restricted. You weren't allowed to use anything but Putonghua on television and in movies. In short, he wanted to make movies about a real China, not a mythologized China. He wanted to go back to Fenyang to make a film, not a beautiful epic or a kung fu masterpiece, but to Jia, that film would typify the new strains and changes going on in China today. In Fenyang, money was redefining personal relationships, families were breaking apart, buildings were being demolished and rebuilt, his films were the opposite of everything that had come before him, and they depicted a sort of bitterly unadorned image of Chinese life. When Jia's first movie came out, a lot of people from the Beijing Film Academy laughed at it. They said the audio track was a mess, it was poorly edited, and it was ugly. But among intellectuals, particularly independent writers and artists, it was groundbreaking. As Chen Danqing, an older painter, put it, we were forbidden from telling the truth for such a long time that we're allowed to do so now, and we don't know how to tell the truth. In the years that followed, Jia made a series of films, and at their core, they revolve around morally complex, imperfect characters trying to make their way in the world. In a sense, all of his films revolve around a single, un unchanging theme, the struggle of Chinese individuals, men and women, to move from one life to another, from one world to another, whether it's a floating migrant or a laid off factory hand or a restless teenager in an old Rust Belt city. All of them are people on the margins of China's, mo of, on the margins of China's boom, and he thinks it's his responsibility to depict their lives to the world. Over time, Jia has emerged as a folk hero not only to Chinese scholars and social critics, but also to gawky, young, pimple faced fans in the provinces who see him as the most eloquent interpreter of their own experience. In his work, we see the foundation of a new style in China, a more realistic aesthetic that is a lot closer to people's lives than what came before. We can call it an aesthetic of authenticity. Returning finally to our topic of the day, 
I argue that the China we need to explain to our friends around the world is not just the home of the Olympics and the Great Wall, or for that matter, the high rises and the pollution in Beijing. It is also the story of a new and increasingly pluralistic country that we can glimpse through the films of Jia Zhangke, the angry pride of Tang Jie, and the inspiring story of Joseph and Wusu. But I also promise you, don't get too used to these stories because there's only one thing we know for sure, which is that they're not going to be the same for long. Thank you very much. <laughs>